on social media or at manxradio.com. For every £60 you spend until Saturday night, you'll receive a voucher for £9 off a £60 shop to use next week. See in store for details. Great prices every day at ShopRite and WineRite Extra. Where would you go to get your Samsung, Sony or Panasonic TV repaired? Walton's, of course. Visit us at Cool Smithy on the Isle of Man Business Park or call 614 536. Walton's. Always there when you need a repair. Why wait when Furniture Land has a huge selection available for immediate delivery? Three-piece suites, dining and living room furniture. And check out the first floor selection of amazing beds too. All from Furniture Land, Carpet Land, West Street, Ramsey. Drive an electric vehicle? Need a charge point? Contact EV Man today for a Wi-Fi enabled pod point with a three-year parts and labour warranty. EV Man are the only approved installer on the island. Contact Kim on 304 09 or evman.im. Air mowers have moved to Unit 2, Jerby Industrial Estate, with loads more choice all under one roof. Husqvarna Auto Mowers, battery and petrol chainsaws, hedge trimmers, strimmers, mowers, and all your gardening needs. Call Air Mowers on 898 589. Men's Radio. Good evening, Fast Am I. This is Manx Radio and welcome to What Matters Most. This is the first of four live programmes where we're going to put your views to our panel of experts. In the next few weeks, we'll be discussing the environment, uh, recycling, climate change, care for the elderly, and finally, health and social care, and that includes mental health too. Tonight, though, we're looking and talking about preservation and heritage. We're also streaming this to you live this evening on Facebook and our website. If you'd like to watch as you listen, that's uh, facebook.com slash manxradio and uh, manxradio.com. It will also be available as a podcast this evening once the programme has finished. It is live, as I say, so if you would like to get in touch, do feel free to. Uh, 166 177 is the number to text us and you can email studio at manxradio.com. So without further ado, let's introduce our expert panel. Well, um, good evening. Yes, my name is Charles Gard and... Uh, I was formerly involved with Culture Vanin. Good evening, Marlene Masker. Um, I'm a former building conservation officer for the Isle of Man, and I'm now an MLC, um, obviously with an interest in, in heritage and culture. I'm Edmund Southworth. I'm the director of Mike's National Heritage. I'm an archaeologist by training, and I spent 40 years in the museums and heritage world. Fast am I, Alex. I am David Killip. I'm the chair of the Guild of Manx Registered Tour Guides, perhaps better known as the Blue Badge Guides. Well, I think it's fair to say we've got a really far-reaching panel this evening. So to start off uh, fairly broadly, I suppose, what area, I'd like you to all answer really if possible, uh, of the island's heritage are you most concerned about? Marley? I think I might lead off. Um, I was employed as building conservation officer, the first officer of that nature on the island, um, for about nine years. And during that time, um, there were re registered buildings um, that we went forward with and the numbers increased substantially. And we were able to get a grant scheme in place, uh, not just for registered buildings, but for conservation areas. Um, I, when I left that post, I went on to work for a local authority in, in another field, but my successor was able to carry on that, that good work, I'd like to say. Um, but with, um, with the passing of time, the grants have disappeared, and at the moment, so far as I am aware, there is no registered buildings officer, no specialist advice available for people who are um, entrusted with the care of these important buildings. And so people have nowhere to go to seek advice other than if they can really afford to pay for a specialist either on or off the island and government have no grants either to help ensure that these buildings are looked after going into the future. Can you give us some examples of the kind of buildings you're talking about? Um, well, it's it's across the board, really. Um, I mean, we've got an amazing Georgian, Victorian, uh, arts and crafts heritage here, as well as vernacular buildings. And um, the use of materials is important, having the, the, the available craftsmanship and skills. Um, we used to run courses, and I know there are occasionally courses available, but uh, we used to run lime mortar workshops, and some of the people who then went on to, to have that as a living started off 
um, learning the basics of lime mortar skills and, and, and materials. And um, that again has disappeared. We, um, we hear an awful lot of publicity about how important the built heritage is, not just to our local um, population, but to our visitors. And uh, whilst we can pay at lip service, um, it's really not being cared for in, in a way that I, I, I think you know, is, is valid and meaningful. Well, funnily enough, um, I, as chairman of the trustees at Milntown, uh, am wanting to undertake some refurbishment inside the house, which I would require uh, registered permission for. And there is no conservation officer I can turn to for advice. And in desperation, I actually contacted Marlene, who used to be the conservation officer when I was on the planning committee years ago, to come round and talk to me and give me some advice, which is very helpful. And this is the sort of thing you would have gone to the government for. And um, I did actually petition Tinwell two or three years ago about this, and we still don't have a conservation officer. And as Marlene says, the grants have all gone, and there is still a, an attitude on the island that if your building is registered, it's a damn nuisance, and the value goes down. Whereas in the UK, uh, having a listed building is a matter of pride, and it puts the, the value of the house or the building up. So we've a long way to go. I'm seeing lots of uh, nodding faces from the other side of the room. I think if you put it into context, the, the Isle of Man has an incredibly rich history. Um, and it's a history which goes back you know, 10,000 years in total. Um, but an awful lot of it is because we have a different history than other parts of the world. I was talking to someone this morning about the Norman Conquest that didn't happen. So we don't speak Norman French. Um, uh, and I think it's it's hugely important to see it in the round. That the buildings that we've got uh, are part of a historic environment, a, a major landscape, whether it's that way because it's been cared for by farmers who did it farmed in a particular way, using sheep rather than big combine harvesters. Uh, so our field systems are different. We've got ancient monuments in the landscape. You can go and walk around, uh, or as, as Charles has done, fly over with drones and see these amazing prehistoric tombs just in the landscape, just just there, because we've not built motorways over them in previous years. And you, you look at that as a, as, a, as a whole. We've got still massive resources underground, which we're still discovering. There's people, there's a treasure in Crest um, you know, this week with another piece of Viking silver com coming up. Um, we've got everything from big castles to Christian churches to prehistoric tombs. And a lot of that is uh, still with us, still in the landscape, still at risk, uh, but it's still something to be, to be treasured. With, with that vast amount of variety when it comes to register building or, or heritage buildings, where how do you measure what is important to keep and preserve and what might be better developed the, and the, moved the on? The principles of significance have been used in the, the business for over 40 years. The Borough Charter in, in, in New South Wales was, was the, the name given to this idea that you measure significance in a variety of ways. And what you do is you put together a picture of significance. Uh, simply put, how many of them are there? How old are they? How complete are they? Uh, are they associated with a particular individual or an architectural style? And so just to throw an example at random, uh, there's a wonderful warehouse in Ramsey sadly falling to pieces because the owners haven't looked after it and it's the only one left so automatically it becomes significant and it's part of the landscape it's part of the townscape all too often we walk past things and we walk past them for generations and then all of a sudden we realise there's only one left. Well, well, that one in question then, you bring it forward. I mean, is, is that somewhere, it's in a, a fantastic location in terms of the centre of the town, it's on the quay. It sh would that not be prime for development, uh, p development that Ramsey's been looking for for some time? Well, development is, takes a variety of forms. Uh, if you look at the centre of Manchester or Dockside Liverpool or St Catherine's Dock in London, reusing historic buildings mm -hmm. has been something... Uh, that, that, that people have been doing for a very long time. You use the energy, you use the natural resources that are locked up in that building, and based on the significance again, if it's of minor significance, yeah, you can modify it, you can rebuild it, you can just keep some of the walls. If it's very important, then you treat it very carefully. I and think, I think we, we do need to be cautious as well, 
sometimes I think we can be too close to the issue and there's a risk that we take buildings and the landscape in which they exist for granted. Because when you see the effect and the impact that buildings or sites that we see every day have on our visitor community, whether they be large groups from a cruise ship or individuals that we take around the island on a one-to-one -one basis, um, it's really quite profound the effect the, the effect that they have. Um, and I'm not just talking about, if you'll forgive the term, Premier League buildings like Castle Russian or Laxey Wheel or Peel Castle, but even um, North Quay in Douglas and some of the quieter, older streets in Douglas where I take guided walks. Visitors from large and, dare we say it, anodyne UK urban areas find these places quite extraordinary. Um, in a way that at times I think it's helpful we are reminded about because it can help concentrate our minds uh, on the need to preserve and where possible enhance them not only as part of an offering for the visiting community but also to safeguard the environment in which we ourselves live. Well, you've both touched on the reusing of these buildings, keeping them as they are, but reusing them another way. And something that kept coming up in the survey was the fact that buildings are left and they are not being preserved. They are being left and into disrepair and they end up being eyesores instead of being preserved as what they could be, reaching their potential. You'd, you'd call it constructive neglect in some cases. And um, when I think back... Uh, to when I was in post, and it's not just me, anywhere where you have um, an officer who has a specialist background. My background was architecture and then conservation. And um, where that type of skilled person can be involved with an owner and actually give advice and help guide that there is a special opportunity there. It shouldn't be seen as a negative side. It can actually aid the good design that goes into redeveloping um, a site that might have a very special building on, on its footprint, but then can be integrated with very tasteful and sensitive redevelopment, but in a way that enhances the streetscape rather than it be you know, be seen with contempt, really. And they say familiarity breeds contempt. And I'm afraid I used to find that it was often people who came to visit our shores that could see the value of our historic context, the squares and the terraces and the vernacular special qualities that we have that really, as we've said, you walk past every day and it's only when a building it becomes under threat, people start to then look at it in a different way. Why do you think so many buildings are then not being preserved? I mean, people seem to think that it's, a, it's an issue, that it's everywhere. Every town you'll go to, someone says, well, that building's not been used for 20 years. This one's a beautiful old building and nothing's happened. Why isn't anything happening? Well, there is, there is a problem because um, the, there is a lack of awareness of what powers actually are available. The, the local authorities on the island all have powers under the 1991 Building Control Act to take action, to take, to take charge. Um, but historically, there's an anxiety. It might be upsetting somebody, um, or it might be costing money. But well, these things have these things have value. Every building has to have a commercial purpose. It has to have a use, unless the government will take it over. I mean, the Castle Mona is a is a classic state uh, a case. I think if you look at the ceiling, the way there's a big hole in the ceiling and the way the building is deteriorated. I'm sure there would have been legislation uh, for a registered building to ensure that mm. the basic upkeep was was attended mm. to. Mm. But obviously the government aren't going to be able to buy that and make it into something. It has to be a developer who comes along. Um, but places in the UK, they are, the government can offer schemes in certain places. I know it's happened in Newcastle, it's happened in Liverpool yeah, quite right. a bit. Uh, government can acquire buildings mm. and offer a nominal fee for someone to do that, do it up in a good way. Should that be adopted here? Well, we must be grateful that the government have bought a number of key buildings like the Laxey Wheel and the Gaiety Theatre, all of which were threatened with... Uh, either being sold off for scrap or, or being demolished. So, uh, and the Camera Obscura, there are buildings that the government and Castle Russian, of course, mm -hmm. that has have taken over and made a brilliant job of. Um, they're keeping the railways going. We mustn't forget how important our horse trams are and the Manx Electric Railway, the oldest surviving commercial railway in the world, 
And as David has said, it's only when you get people coming over here and they are gobsmacked by what we've got that you begin to see this in a different light. And it's very salutary to speak to these visitors and tourists and realise that we do have something exceptional here and there's such a danger of us taking it all for granted. And I think, dare I say, our politicians need to refresh their attitude towards all this because it is a vital part. If we are bringing these people over and the best thing that they've got to do is go to Marks and Spencer to shop because everything else is gone, then we'll just suddenly notice that we've got a wasteland it's, it's and awesome. we need to prevent that from happening. I, I think it's hugely reassuring that this, that this is what the survey said. Um, and it's a big enough sample for us to take it seriously. And the implication is that there's a little bit of a disconnect between what the public want and what some of the policies in the public sector and and the private sector uh, are, are saying, and I think people need to need to listen to some things that are being said. I think it's a great opportunity for a debate as to who's responsible for these, um, who should who should pay, is this the taxpayer or is it charity? Um, or there's no such thing as government money; it's all taxpayers' money in the in the end. Uh, and I'm quite happy to pay a bit more for a decent environment. Um, I'm happy to pay more for decent hospital services, and I don't see one as being different from the other. If we want people to come and invest, to to bring their businesses, to bring up their children here, uh, to you know stay here and and have an education on the island, we've got to have a good quality of life and a landscape, a historic environment, um, care for culture, for language, uh, for for local traditions is all part of that mix. There's no uh, doubt that um, when we see the year-on-year -year increases in cruise visitors, for example, um, there is no doubt that the feedback, the, the cruise companies are extremely efficient at taking feedback from passengers, feeding it into their future schedules, deciding what tours they want to run in particular locations. And there is no doubt that the feedback that has been generated by visitors to the island about the historic tapestry, be it buildings, be it anecdotes, be it landscape, whatever. There is no doubt that that feedback it w is generating very positive responses, um, which, is, which is a, a virtuous circle. It's leading to more visitors. It's leading to greater awareness of what we have to offer. Um, and uh, I, I agree with, with what the others have said. You, you can't kind of separate Pres preserving historic buildings from preserving larger urban or rural areas from the landscape, from those things that are specific to a, 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 a tourism offering. We're talking so a lot it, about it, tourism and, and visitors there. How much emphasis should be on them over the resident of the Isle of Man that's living here pretty much 365 at days? Uh, th there's a Facebook comment, if I, I could just read it. Okay. When the cruise ships come in, the ordinary visitors have to wait ages to ride a, the scheduled trams or even use Snaefell. All the trams are reserved for the cruise visitors. Uh, if they, br they bring as much to the island as we are told, why not lay on extra cars like they did back in the day? I think I know who that's uh, come from because I stood for ages at Laxey uh, <laughs> and the trains going up Snaefell were all full with tourists. And what a great thing to do. Well, yeah. well, it is, and yeah. it's fantastic to see those trams going past full in the summer. But, um, you know, there, there are words coming to me from a government department, I won't say which, where it's all about the bottom line now, all about the bottom line. And I think that would be tragic if... Uh, whatever benefit the cruise ships and, and our visitors give us. The first people for whom this heritage is important are the local people. Mm -hmm. It's for us, it's my heritage um, and my family's heritage and everybody's here on the island. That has to be the first consideration. And occasionally, as has been alluded to, government has a responsibility for all aspects of the society and if it means mm -hmm. giving a bit more money to these things, as well as the health service, that's just... The, the task that they've the, got to juggle the, with. The tourist and the local, in my eyes, are not indivisible. I mm. think if these things are properly managed, if we respect the heritage, invest in it carefully, um, both, both groups um, will benefit. So I don't think it's a case of prioritising the needs of visitors over prioritising the, the wishes of the locals. With, with imagination and foresight, both can be combined entirely successfully. And I think it's fair to say that if we relied on the local population uh, to pay for everything, we wouldn't have as much as we do. Uh, and that includes restaurants, hotels, mm. shops, retail. 
I must tell you a Kipper story. Uh, Noble Caledonia, uh, one of the one of the high end cruise ships. I mean, it's eight thousand pounds a cabin uh, for a Noble Caledonia, um, <laughs> and they, they, I'm told. Uh, they came to see us at the World Travel Market the other week in London to talk about logistics and their future visits. And a uh, simple uh, point, uh, the guy said, yeah, I bought the entire stock of kippers I could find on the island. Uh, and we fed the boat for, for the next week or so on, on Manx kippers. And everyone went, he said. And it's just little things. You realise that actually these things have the mm -hmm. potential to add add value. Absolutely. Pe people are looking for experiences. Absolutely. And they're prepared to pay... Uh, and sadly, they're prepared to pay more uh, because they value it more than some of the local people. And getting that balance right is a challenge. And I think it's quite a, an interesting mm. debate, really. You know, what is the value of what we've got? And has it, o, has it reiterates tourism gone, though? I mean, do you remember the day when the tourist board used to go to every town, used to go to all the trade fairs? And all that's stopped now, hasn't it? Yes, and, yeah. very, and to be honest, there's very little point in doing is it there? because mm. we don't have... Well, we've just lost Thomas Cook, for example, which is the last vestiges of the high street network. Mm. Um, we work with wholesalers. Two or three companies make up something like 80% of the business. And, that, and that's, that's really good. They're showing, I think, this year, 9% increase. And interesting, people talk about, you know, coaches on the CFL. We're having trouble now with the capacity on the Steam Packet Company uh, because there's more people wanting to come every, every year. So... Doing it a different way. Oh, well, the government own that now, so that'll um, be sorted. Well, we just just buy another boat. That's the easy, <laughs> easy answer. And I, I also think um, our young people are actually becoming more vocal. They're more communicative and more aware of what the environment is about. And we have to remember that we're talking now in this moment in time, but we are only trustees. What we have to do is take care of all, all the special qualities that we are lucky enough to have but to go into the future and we should not undervalue that because um, like the biosphere um, it gets shouted from the hilltops by my political colleagues but that includes it's not just the natural environment it's very much the built environment that we have got to value and I know um, Comin who uh, are at the top of the tree but the cabinet office look after planning policy part of the the plan for government says that there's going to be an audit of historic uh, environment uh, starting in 2020 well in my view that's not really soon enough um, it's it's been sat on for too long we've got no registered buildings officer and that's that that place has been vacant for and several a long years. long list of registered buildings, or buildings yeah. uh, supposed to be registered, that's 40 years old, for heaven's sake. And the longer it's left, the more buildings become endangered. Mm. But we, we have a joint responsibility and look at the positives that we can get from this. Um, the, the director of Dublin Ports, they're looking at developing. He came to talk to us about 15 months ago and he said the Isle of Man is the jewel in the potential Irish Sea Crown. We are, we're coming full circle really back to, to this registered buildings. Uh, getting some comments in, so we are running out of time, but I'll try and get a few in. Uh, the combine warehouse in Ramsey we talked about earlier. Uh, this is a building which seemingly isn't cherished and well-loved, and it gets in the way of proposals of major developments in Ramsey. I've not seen any proposals for any developments on that site, and if the owners neglect things, then the owners should put them right. Simple. And with the right guidance, it could be part of a really exciting scheme. So what, what would you see happen to that building then? It's not for me to say that. It's the, for the owner of the building to consider its future and to consider it properly. All the, all the registering a building means, in effect, is looking closely at it. The presumption is against demolition, but demolition is still possible. Major modification is still possible. It just has to be thoughtful and reflect what this building is telling you in the landscape. And you would expect that any development on that site reflected the key side, the, f the shape and f style of those buildings. You wouldn't expect a big glass monstrosity like the one that's being proposed on Douglas South uh, Key. South, oh South my key, goodness, you would hope someone it says is in vernacular style, but not on this island, it's not vernacular style. No. I think that reinforces the po exactly the point I made before about not losing sight of individual buildings in a larger um, in a larger environment or, or larger urban environment because um, the quayside in Ramsey is a part, is a significant part of a guided walk that other guides do through Ramsey, f again for cruise ship visitors or, or individual tourists. Um, and it, it sits alongside other 
key parts, pardon the pun, of Ramsey, such as the Swing Bridge, such as the former shipyards, um, the Market Square. So careful thought needs to be given. You know, if you take one tooth out of a set of gleaming white teeth, you're going to notice the difference. And it's important also as well to see that times and fashions change because the conservation area, in most of the conservation areas on the island were designed around Georgian or early Victorian town centres and urban centres. Now we understand that industrial landscapes are hugely important. Mm. And, and Charles, you've, you've brought to the fore quite a lot of 20th century landscapes, mm. such as the World War I, World War II mm. uh, remains. And, and the legacy of World War I and World War II on this island is staggering it's and internationally important. Yeah. Yeah. But the conservation areas don't reflect that. Someone drew the lines uh, on, a, on a pen very, very long time ago. And then you suddenly find, oh, it's 200 yards outside that line. We can't even think about it, which is a nonsense, really. I'm going to have to draw it to a close there, I'm afraid, if you can believe it. It has been half an hour. Uh, so that is all we have time for. The topic has been preservation and heritage. I think we've just touched the surface, really. But next week, John Moss will lead the discussion on the environment, recycling, and the week after, care for the elderly. Finally, the, uh, then on the 16th of December, we will talk health and social care, including, of course, mental health too. Thank you to my studio guests, uh, Charles Gard, Marley Masker, Edmund Southworth and David Killip for joining me this evening. Thank you. And, uh, for now then thank you at home for listening have a lovely evening as i pass you on to chris kinley now for greatest hits